Good morning. It's great to be with you. And this is probably one of my favorite things to talk about, um, conversion and sharing our faith, evangelization, sharing our faith. First of all, we have to have a faith to share. We have to be joyful about our faith because that is probably the most winsome way to bring others to the faith. I'd like to begin with just a, a brief prayer. We've bathed this whole thing in prayer. Some of you were at Mass this morning. We had the, uh, the rosary. But let's just go ahead and, and let's just ask for the intercession of St. Monica and another mother. So we're going to ask for two mothers together to join us today in interceding and over the course of these nine days, of course, the Blessed Mother. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, you have given us the greatest gift in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you will fill us with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, that we will be ignited as with that descent of the Holy Spirit to go out and share and to turn our world upside down with this gift of the Paschal mystery of our Lord Jesus Christ. We trust in you. We trust in the graces that you give us to accomplish this. It is not by our work, but it is by you, by your power of the Holy Spirit, that this is accomplished. Lord God, as we were in the, in the area before and we saw all of the empty spaces, God, right now, I ask that you will place on our heart a new vision, a vision of all of those empty spaces filled with the very ones that we bring to this novena, that you will give us eyes, your eyes, to see this space filled with those very people, that you will give us the grace to believe that through you it can happen. We ask all these things things through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and through the intercession of our Lord's mother and St. Augustine's mother, St. Monica. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you for gathering together as a community today, and I, I really do hope that this is, this is the, the posture of your heart today. That whoever you have decided to pray for during this time, during this novena, that you really do believe that God can accomplish this. That you don't come here with a spirit of discouragement, or if you did, that you dropped it at the door. And that when you came in and you saw this glorious building... It's glorious here that your heart was filled with hope. That we, too, are given every gift we need to carry on the mission that has been carrying on for 2,000 years. So thank you for coming and for bringing with you in your heart those who are lost and fallen away. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you have someone on your heart today. Okay, put your hands down. Now I'm going to ask you if you have multiple people on your heart today. Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. Now I'm going to ask you if you have 12 people on your heart today, or approximately 12 or more. Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. Now you're probably really discouraged. But I want you to think about something. This entire church began with our Lord Jesus Christ and 12 apostles who weren't yet apostles, they were fishermen. And they are the reason we're here today. So 12 is not too little. It is not too much. I want you to come with great expectations and what our God can accomplish. I also want you to think about one other thing today, and is that you are here also to reclaim the parts of yourself that have fallen away. 
Because to be truly witnesses for the faith in a winsome way, you need to be filled with joy. You need to be whole. You need to be about this mission 100%. Now, our church does not ask us to be saints already because no one here is a saint yet. No one's canonized as far as I know in this room. So our church says, immediately go and share what you've received. Don't wait around to become saints. But our faith does say, you know, you will be more effective. You will be more efficacious if you do claim those parts that have fallen away and you give those to Christ. We are clear. This is a work of grace. It is not a work we accomplish you will become extremely frustrated if you believe this is a work you accomplish. It is a work you say yes to and you join your yes to graces. But this is God's work. And that's good news because this is not something you can't do, sharing Christ. It's a message that shares almost itself. You just have to be the embodiment of it. So, it's God's work, but we're called to intercede. And it's a novena. So let's be mindful of the fact we need the descent of the Holy Spirit for this, right? We need the descent of the Holy Spirit in our lives in order to be able to have a Pentecost around us. So we had, maybe I should insert here, what a novena, the first novena. We have the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he ascends into heaven, he says, go and pray together. The apostles meet to pray. Our blessed mothers, they're praying with them. They pray for nine days, and it's Pentecost. Happens to be a Jewish holiday. So there are people from all over the known world in Jerusalem that day. Okay, so they're already there. God's timing is amazing. They call it the Feast of Sevens because it's seven weeks of seven days from Passover to their, their holiday, the Feast of Sevens. So when you think about it, it's the same thing. We have the resurrection, and then we have 50 days, Pentecost. So they were already there. So ascension on the 40th day, 49th day, they're there for their Jewish holiday, and now it's the descent of the Holy Spirit. God knew what he was doing to bring all of them together, so there's a reason. That they, it wasn't a coincidence. They were there speaking different languages. But we talk about a novena and praying for nine days for something in particular that we need, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit for it. That's where it comes from, those nine days of praying. So if a non-Catholic asks you, What's a novena? That sounds too Catholic for me. It's like something you, you all made up in the, in like, I don't know, Middle Ages. He said, no, no, no. It's in your Bible. And it is the time period when they prayed and the descent of the Holy Spirit. So we need Mother Mary with us. We need to be praying these nine days. We need to pray with expectation, with the same confidence that they did that the Holy Spirit would come. We need to pray for that as well. Open your hearts. Pray for an outpouring of graces. And as we do this, as we go through this day, I want you to have in our midst two mothers. I want you to have the Blessed Mother because she was there at the first novena. And I want you to have St. Monica with you. We have her right behind me. I asked to have her brought over before I stood up and gave the talk. So we have Mother Mary and we have St. Augustine's mother, St. Monica, with us. And we're going to Fall in love with St. Monica. So, let's talk about the Blessed Mother. Let's talk about St. Monica. St. Monica has been a part of the church for 1,600, 1,700 years. They are our best intercessors for this particular work of intercession, for conversion, for bringing others back to the church or to the church for the very first time. Because Mary's son, Christ, is the one we want to bring them to. And St. Monica's son was, he was a wild, wild guy. 
So if you have brought someone with you in your heart, and you're like, this person, this one I love, I don't think, I don't know, this is going to take a massive work of grace. If St. Monica could pray her son into the faith, you can. St. Monica, or Augustine was a wild, wild man, and he became a doctor of the church. Amazing. So, we have two mothers, we have two sons, we have the Savior, and we have the one who became saved even in spite of his crazy, crazy life. Just as with the novena, the first novena, the Holy Spirit shows up, that's God showing up, God's going to show up. Be expecting it. Now, I travel a lot, and I give a lot of talks in the visitation. It's my I have two books over there. One is a bigger book, and it's called Gifts of the Visitation, and one is a smaller book, and it's on Stations of the Cross. For those especially who have trauma in their life, and I have some trauma in my life, so if you've had any kind of trauma and that's kind of getting in your way, and it's, or the person you're praying for has had trauma in his or her life, that might be for you. It's only $2.50. That little prayer book, Stations of the Cross, is pretty inexpensive, and it's, it's really a powerful way to offer up the trauma and to come to Christ through your trauma. The other one is $14.95, and it's on the visitation. And so I, I do a lot of talks on the visitation. And I love the visitation because really it's what we're here about today. You have Mary receiving Christ in her womb at the Annunciation. And we receive Christ when we come to this altar to receive the Eucharist. And then we are sent out. What's the very next thing Mary does after receiving Christ at the Annunciation? It's the second joyful mystery. You go from the Annunciation, the first one, the second joyful mystery is the visitation. She goes out to Elizabeth. So when you think about that, so to follow in the footsteps of the Blessed Virgin Mary, you're going to receive Christ, which you do anytime you come to Mass. And then you're going to go out and share with as much efficacy and power because you've been given Christ. This is not, you're not going on your own steam. You are going to share Christ with the Elizabeth in your world. You are called converted, and then you're sent out to share with others. Monica, too, does the same thing. Maybe it's even easier for us to look at her, because we're like, yeah, well, that was the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know, I mean, she's the Immaculate Conception, and I'm hardly conceived without sin, right? So let's look at St. Monica. What did she do? She received Christ in the Eucharist. So she received him in the manner that we do. And then she went out to share that faith. But she didn't have to go 80 miles from her home in Nazareth to Elizabeth's home, which is near Jerusalem. She went to those right in her own home. The pagans that she lived with, her husband was a pagan. He was a womanizer. He was mean to her, not very kind with his words. A year before he died, he converted and became a Catholic. That's her husband. Her son had a mistress, had a child with his mistress. He was wild and crazy. He ran away. She followed him everywhere he went. And in those times, it was almost like Mary's time. I mean, like 300 years, like 300 AD, 400 AD. She didn't have a car to go and like follow him. She couldn't just hop on an airplane like I did to come from St. Louis to come to San Francisco. She followed him wherever he went. He too was a pagan, and she lived to see his conversion. She lived to see her mother-in-law's conversion. So she receives Christ in the Eucharist, and she goes to her own family to share and one by one in this pagan world, they turn to Christ. Now, what is, 
what does this have to do with us? Why do we even remember? There's so many people who probably had people in their families converted. Why do we even look to St. Monica? Why do we think about St. Augustine? Because what happened to St. Augustine, his entire life changed after he came to Christ. He became a doctor of the church, and he wrote one of the most amazing books I've ever read called Confessions by St. Augustine, and it's his story. It's a very easy read. I highly recommend it. And here's the crazy thing. Father was saying, okay, how I came to the church, how I was like a Protestant minister's daughter, which I was, M. I don't think that ever is like past tense. And then I inherited my father's library after he passed away. And within his library was the book Confessions by St. Augustine. So while I read Carmelite Saints, and that was the final part of my journey in, what isn't in that bio is the very first book I ever read that started my journey into the church was St. Augustine's Confessions. So one could ask themselves, would I be here today if it weren't for St. Monica praying for her son, St. Augustine? That is the kind of impact one conversion can have on the world. Hundreds of years later, you can have someone who's going out to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and her story began with a little book she found in her father's personal library by a saint converted because of St. Monica. Now, we think too small. The people we are interceding for here today, we just want them to come into the faith or come back to the sacraments. We think, and that is massive, that is incredible, that is wonderful, but don't think too small. The person that you're praying for could be another St. Augustine and then affect thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Imagine if all of you would truly grasp the St. Monica fidelity to praying for these people. And they went out and changed the world. San Francisco would never be the same. And it's possible. Now, I want to start with um, just this proclamation. You know, you, you look in the Old Testament, and you see Judith has this song. They call it a canticle. Hannah conceives after being barren, and she has Samuel is the son that she conceived, and she sings this song. It's Hannah's canticle. And at uh, the visitation, Mary has her Magnificat, which she proclaims, and we all know it really well. And those who do um, the office readings and, and, and the evening prayers, you know Zachariah's canticle. Well, for this, I went back into the Psalms, Psalm 40. And I took a passage from Psalm 40, and I called it St. Monica's Canticle. Now, of course, St. Monica didn't live in the Old Testament. So I just took it because I think this cat encapsulates St. Monica. So this comes from Psalms chapter 40. And I want you to think about St. Monica saying this, singing this, proclaiming this. The Lord bent down and heard my cry. We see her with her tears in here. She literally wept tears, many, many tears for this son. The Lord bent down and he heard my cry and drew the lost one, my son, out of the pit of destruction, out of the mud of that swamp, and put a new song in his mouth. And he becomes a doctor of the church. Set his feet upon the rock of the church. And put a new song in his mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And so I said, I said, here I am. To do your will is my delight, says St. Monica. And I announce your deeds to the great assembly. I did not restrain my lips. Your loyal deliverance I have proclaimed to this great assembly. 
for the kingdom and the power and the glory belong to our God. Songs of praise are beautiful, aren't they? What's yours? To have a faith that someone else wants, you have to have a joy. You maybe aren't a singer. Maybe that's not your thing. But you have to exude whatever is your thing. You have to exude Christ in that, through that. And it has to be something others can perceive. So what are some of your gifts? How do you proclaim your canticle, your song of joy? Okay. If, if someone, let me, let me ask you this, and don't be shy. Anyone in here had an impact, even small, had an impact on someone coming into the faith or coming back to the sacraments? Raise your hands. God bless you. That is fabulous. The next thing you should do with that is talk about it. Share that. All too often, if we have an impact on somebody, we are just, we marvel. Wow, God, thank you for using that. Thank you for bringing them back to the sacraments. But do we then go out and tell others and share with others? St. Augustine did it. St. Monica was so excited. She's like, okay, I'm good to go, God. You can take me. I'm ready to go. This was my life's hope, my life's mission, and I live to see it. The ultimate purpose, though, is not to hear ourselves speak. It's not to hear myself speak. It's not to just sing a pretty song, a canticle. All of this is meaningless if it doesn't propel us to become holy. You know, it's St. Paul who says, Woe to me if I proclaim the gospel, and yet I am disqualified in the end. So run your race so as to win. Bring people to Christ, share Christ, but be mindful of your own personal journey. I think about this a lot because I go and I give talks a lot. Woe to me if I share the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that brings others to Christ and through them many, many more, and I lose my own soul. Woe to me if that should happen. But balance it out. St. Paul doesn't say, oh, no, I'm not going to make it. He fights the good fight. He doesn't give up. So have a balanced approach to this path of sanctification. You can fall away. But if you are like St. Paul, and you're like, I, I am going to run this race. I'm going to pick myself up when I fall, and I'm going to get to the confessional, and I am going to get right with God, and I'm going to get back to the sacraments, and I'm going to do it every time I have to because my goal is to remain faithful. So today we look at these two mothers. And I'm going to first start, and I'm going to probably have this pattern. I'm going to look at Mary, then I'm going to look at Monica. Mary, Monica, Mary, Monica, and then every once in a while I'll throw me in there. Not that I should even be in their realm, but personal stories, right? Let me insert this. Personal stories are huge. If God has done something in your life, heaven forbid that you sit on that secret. Share it. We love stories. Stories change lives. So Mary and Elizabeth, Mary receives Christ, the Annunciation, she goes out to share him. Into the hills of Judea, and she proclaims the Magnificat. And why do I like these two, Mary and Elizabeth? Because it is the first Christ-centered friendship of all time. Well, yeah, you have Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament. You have Jonathan and David in the Old Testament. You have Naomi and Ruth in the Old Testament. But then you get to the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, and you see Mary and Elizabeth. So this is the first Christ-centered relationship of all time, and it's between two women. I love that. Just as a woman, I think that's pretty cool. It's between two women. And they knew what no one else in the world knew. They knew the Messiah was on his way in Mary's womb. First Christ-centered friendship of all time. Think about that. 
for many of you, the way you will reach the person or people that you're praying for is through relationship, through friendship. But not a relationship or a friendship that stays silent. We tend to do this and love you Catholics. I'm a convert, so I say it this way. Love you Catholics, but you just keep your faith kind of quiet. Right? And I grew up Protestant, a little bit evangelical Protestant. Dad was Wesleyan when I was little, and then he became Presbyterian. And we, from the time we were little, were told to go out and share your faith. So for me, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I don't know how to shut up about my faith. Now, if you met me outside of this, I'm an introvert. I went to teachers' meetings this last week, and I was the new teacher, uh, new for this school. I'm not new to teaching, that didn't say anything. I just kind of sat there. And I listened, and then it was good, but I'm not the one who's, like, jumping in all the time. So you would think, oh, she's, you know, she's really an introvert. But if you're here today, you're like, wow, she's just, you know, she's an extrovert. No, but when it comes to the faith, it is too important to keep quiet. It is too important to keep it little and just your own. Be willing to share it. Be willing to talk about it. How will they know otherwise, right? How will they know if you are unwilling to share it? So, you know, this, it tends to come in clusters like this, you know? We, we, even the saints, we see the saints. So, so after I went from Confessions by St. Augustine, I went into the, the Carmelite books. By the way, literature is my major. So God gets people's attentions by what they love. Let me insert this here. If you're thinking about how God might get the attention of the people that you're praying for, what do they love? Do they love art? Do they love music? Do they love books? What is it they love? God is sending graces in those ways. Find a way to connect those for them. So... <clears throat> We have a tendency to see them coming in pairs, and even the saints do the same thing. So I went to the Carmelites, and it was St. John of the Cross. I read next. And just so you know why I actually was looking, I had no intention to become Catholic. And most of the people that you're talking about have no intention to become Catholic or to come back to the faith. So that doesn't even have to be part of the, the dynamic. But I had a question. So maybe they have a question. And my question was, my dad had suffered and died. And I knew God was real, is real. So it didn't make sense to me that a God who is all-powerful and all-loving, and we know he's both, would allow my father to suffer in the way that he did. And it's really re re weird because he suffered many years from some neurological disorders, but he died suddenly from a pulmonary embolism, which had nothing to do with the neurological disorder. So then I was left with, why did you do that, God? Why didn't you, just, I mean, if you were going to take him, why didn't you just take him suddenly from the pulmonary embolism? Or if he had to suffer, give him something that, that's how he, why this? I don't get it. What is suffering all about? What was the purpose of that? And then I read St. John of the Cross, Dark Night of the Soul. That one, unlike St. Augustine's Confessions, is a little bit harder to read. It's a little bit deeper. And from there, I went to his spiritual companion, St. Teresa of Avila, and I read Interior Castle. So I bring this up to tell you two pairs. They came in twos. St. Monica was St. Augustine. St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila. God has a plan to bring not only you, but for you to attach to others that you bring with you into eternity. Coming in pairs. Now, we also have another person to throw into this mix, another person who's quite interesting, and I think it's important to talk about him, and that's St. Ambrose. St. Monica was so, her heart was so heavy for her son, and so she did what I suggest you do, bring in a spiritual director to attach to, to ask to intercede with you. Your priest when you go to the confessional and you confess, and there will be times where you have to confess, I'm, I'm 
practically despairing of this right now, or maybe you have. Take that into the confessional and ask, after your absolution, ask for the prayers of the priest for this one. And I mentioned St. Ambrose because St. Ambrose didn't have to do anything from St. Monica's cause. All he was really compelled to do was listen to her, you know, listen to her confession if she wanted to confess. But he took it seriously to join with her and to take on this son of her heart. So, <clears throat> point to make here is this. All of you here today have at least one person and maybe many people that are on your heart that you're praying for, right? We've already established that. But what if her prayers are for people on her heart, but what if she can become a witness to the person this person praying for, right? And what if she doesn't even know who that person is, but she becomes like the St. Ambrose and like, okay, I'll, I'll pray. And if that person comes into my life, I won't be silent because I'm like, oh, that's not who I'm praying for. If everybody here would get the understanding that, yes, I'm here to intercede and pray for the people God has put on my heart, but there are other people interceding for people I don't know, and they're going to be at the coffee shop when I'm there. So when you say, yes, I had something to do with someone coming into the faith or coming back to the faith, I want you to also be about the business of bringing, planting seeds that you will never see harvested. You not only have to be about the business of helping those you love, but those you don't know, those you encounter today, next week, next month. Because if we all did that, because that's what the apostles did. They didn't like, oh, gee, I just really want my mother saved. And I, I really want my brother's wife to come to know Christ. Right? They were like, I want the whole world to know Christ. And that's how we must be. St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose shows us that the pairs don't necessarily have to be focused on the same person. But you can be a St. Ambrose for somebody else's person. Now, let's look at St. Augustine. Who was she praying for? St. Augustine was lost. He was a pagan, and he dabbled in pagan things. And then he dabbled, and he also liked philosophy. And he was really in intelligent. And sometimes people who are really intelligent have a really hard time because they want to overthink this or it can't be what, what it is. In fact, when he read, I think it was the Gospels, or when he read the Bible, he's like, it's just, I don't know, it just isn't deep enough for me or something. I don't know. But it has to be able to be winsome for everybody at every intellectual level, right? So then he decided that he became he subscribed to Manichaeism, the Manis. And the Manis, they, they, didn't, they didn't do this, this deep mystery thing, but they took pieces from all kinds of religions and they threw them all together. So he followed that for a while. They also despised Christians. So this is what his mother was dealing with. St. Augustine also had a mistress and she had, they had a child together. Sounds a little bit like today. You're probably discouraged because you can relate to this. I'm going to throw in here, I'm going to tell you a story in a little bit when we get, I think, to the third talk. I have a daughter. I have four children, actually. My third child. Before she got married, she had three children by two different fathers. So, in fact, I think she, yep, she was pregnant with the fourth child when she got married. I can relate to this. I can relate to it. It's the, it's the way our country is right now. It's, the, it's what's, what they see in entertainment. How can we not expect them 
to be all messed up when all of the voices they get in music and entertainment tell them one thing, and we're trying to live a life that's different. But their life is going to hit a, a brick wall because that life can't be sustained. Okay, that lifestyle can't be sustained. They're going to hit a wall, and you have to be able to be there. My daughter is now Catholic, and all of my five grandsons first cradle Catholic ever in my family. If God can do that, he can take your struggle with whatever your situation is you're dealing with, okay? Now, it's not easy for her. She has a path that's t really tough, but that is, and she knows this, this has become her path to sanctification. Being the best mother she can possibly be, making sure those children are raised in the faith, even letting them know that before she ever became Catholic, when she was pregnant, it was the year of St. John Vianney, or the year of the priest, and I was praying to St. John Vianney that I would have a grandson who would become a priest. That's when she was pregnant with the first one. And then now she tells me, please stop praying for them to become priests, for me to have, pray for a sister, please, because I'd like a little girl someday, so... St. Monica knew what it was like to have a son who was really messed up. And she, re, or he rebuffed her at every turn. But like Monica, who believed against all doubt that her son would convert, let us commit to interceding. Let us anticipate what our God can do for those who he has placed on our hearts today. I'm going to read you a passage from Confessions by St. Augustine. This is what St. Augustine says of his mother. She begged for the salvation of her son's soul. He's talking of himself. Now she, he's talking to God. It was your gift that she was the way she was. You were near to her, listening and working the plan that you had determined would happen from the start. Her faithful heart grabbed hold of each promise, and she always continued praying, urging you to be faithful to what you had shown her about me. For you established a trust relationship with those who have experienced your eternal mercy. You have forgiven all their sins, and they look to you to keep all your promises. Have we established a trust relationship with God who has been merciful to us? Because he has with us. He's established a relationship of trust with us. Have we established, as St. Monica did, a relationship of trust with him? Because we have been forgiven our sins, and we look to him to keep his promises. It's an interesting thing. I didn't write this in here, but who was that for you? Who did that for you? We are pushing it forward, looking down the road. But who was instrumental for you being here? That's a tough one for me because my dad was a Protestant minister. My mom kind of thinks I'm nuts that I became Catholic. Nobody in my family has become Catholic. In my immediate family, my husband has. Two of my children have. I have four children. Two of them were older. I'm still praying them in. One is going to become a missionary in Papua New Guinea, a Protestant minister, minister. And the other one married a fallen away Catholic, so that's who I'm praying for. Um, I have to say... Initially, St. Augustine, because I read his confessions, the two Carmelite saints, and then when I came into the church, my RCIA leader, and then another woman, and if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about her, but who was that one for you? See what St. Augustine does here? He praises her, but he puts in the proper perspective. He praises her because of her relationship with God, who is the ultimate reason. Okay, that he came to the faith. 
maybe if that person is still living, go tell them. Thank you. Thank you for having such trust and faithfulness that I came to the faith or I came back to the faith. Now, if that person isn't living, find another way. Because they are still living in, in, in God, right? So maybe ask for their intercession for whoever it is you're now praying for. Or if you have the, the, the monetary ability to do it, maybe make a donation somewhere, you know, in, as a memorial for them. We have St. Vincent de Paul um, at our parish. You can make a donation to a food pantry, for example. Do something to say, thank you. So that's what we're striving here for today, a good end. And you may have doubts, and you may feel hopeless, and you probably do or you wouldn't be here because there are plenty of things for you to do on a Saturday that you showed up here. Thanks be to God. Now, we get a little bit intimidated because if you go and look at the statistics, they say in every parish, 7% of the parish does all of the work of the parish. Have you ever heard that statistic? Matthew Kelly and Sherry Woodall, they both kind of say that. And it really sounds discouraging, but it gets worse. Um, 7% do all of the work. But of that 7%, a very small slice of them, when polled, believed that they were evangelizers. Yikes. So if only 7% of any given parish is doing all of the work of the parish, but even only a small sliver of them, let's say 2% or whatever, considers themselves to be evangelists, how can the faith keep going? How do we pass it on? Everyone needs to be a Christ sharer, a Christ bearer, okay? All of us are called to do. In fact, it's Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, who says it's our supreme duty. It's our supreme duty to share Christ. Let me say that again. Supreme duty to share Christ. Pope Benedict XVI said it's unthinkable. He uses the word unthinkable. It's unthinkable that someone would come to the sacraments and have the joy of knowing the sacramental life and then not go out to share that with someone else. It's unthinkable. Mary, who is the Christ bearer and Christ sharer, is the blueprint for us. And St. Monica shows us how to remain faithful. We look at Mary, we're like, but yeah, well, you know what? You were that special one. St. Monica is the one, and your son, or what, by the way, Mary, your son was perfect. He was God, so, you know, there's that. And my son is certainly not, or my daughter is certainly not perfect. Look at St. Monica then, before you just completely just dismiss it. St. Monica shows us how to remain faithful when we have every reason to doubt. St. Monica shows us that we have a reason for our hope even when it seems like we have every reason to doubt. She doesn't make it look easy. That's why she has her little vial of tears. She doesn't make it look like it's easy, but she makes it look like there's nothing else we can do. It's what I must do. It's what I must. She has a mother's heart. I must, must be about the business of helping this child, this grown son, come to the faith. I love uh, the visitation, as I said, I've written about it. When you think about evangelization, I do want you to think about it as a divine visitation. When we think of the visitation, Mary going to visit Elizabeth, we think Mary visits Elizabeth, and she did. That's where we get the word visitation. But there are a lot of writings in the church that talk about it. You're, You're limiting it. It's too small if that's how you think about it. Because really what it is, is God visiting us, okay? So when you share Christ with another person, Mary went to share Christ within her womb with Elizabeth. This is the visitation. A lot of the writers, Catholic writers through the centuries have said this is a divine visitation because really what's happening on this mystical level is God is visiting Elizabeth through the Christ child which Mary brings. 
when you evangelize, this is exciting stuff. When you evangelize, it's a visitation. God shows up. Do you love to come and receive the Eucharist and Holy Communion? I mean, that's Jesus Christ. If that excites you and if that ignites you and your faith, think about this. When you go out those doors and you share Christ with someone else, God shows up. It's a divine visitation. So maybe Mary may make it look very easy. St. Monica makes it look possible even when it isn't easy. Let it be who you are. As much a part of who you are as a mother is a mother. God visits us, conversion. Then he sends us evangelization, and then he makes us fit for heaven, that sanctification. And those are the three things I want you to take away with you today, and they all fit together. God visits us for a conversion, and maybe it's whoever visited us come to receive the Eucharist. Is it you through Christ in the Eucharist? You go and visit others, that's them having God come to them. This is conversion. God comes to us. Then he sends us, like at the end of Mass. Sends us to do what? To share Christ, maybe through what we do, but also through what we say. By the way, first teaching position was in a Catholic high school, and I wasn't Catholic. I was actually married to a man who was a Protestant minister. Marriage was annulled. My three oldest come from that marriage. And I was sitting in the faculty lunchroom, and I said to Brother Roger, Brother Roger, what are all the students doing at Mass? Keep in mind, it's a Catholic high school. Have you ever watched Field of Dreams, the movie? That is the town where the, the school was. Teeny tiny town in Iowa. And it was actually right about the time when that movie was, was filmed, just sideline. So I was in, Brother Roger, what are all the students doing in Mass? Um, I can't make heads or tails out of it. And he said, well, tell me a little about what we're doing in the Mass at that time, and maybe I can tell you what, what this gesture is. It's like, I don't know. It's, it's like, it's they're, they're readings, and they're like, I don't know. It looks like they're swatting flies, but I, I think they're touching their forehead, and I don't know. But you know, we lived in rural Iowa, so there were flies. So like, they could have been swatting flies, but they were all doing it at the same time, so I knew it was something. And he goes, oh, that's right before... Um, the gospel reading, it's the gospel acclamation where we make a cross on our forehead I'm like, and then on our lips and on our heart. I'm like, that's it. What are you doing? He goes, okay, well, we make a cross on our heads to say, may the story of our Lord's life, death, resurrection, ascension remain in my mind that I ponder it. And then we make a cross on our lips to say, may the story of our Lord's life, death, resurrection, ascension remain on my lips and be quick to share with others. Did you know that's what you're doing? That's what this means. Then he says, and we make a cross on our hearts to say, may our Lord's life, death, resurrection, ascension remain in my heart and burn with a holy zeal. Preacher's kid, at that time was also a preacher's wife. He was sitting to my left and I turned to him like, I couldn't speak. Here's why. What he said was so amazing that I didn't know how to respond to that. Second thing was I was so ashamed of myself because I was collecting a paycheck to teach in this school, but I assumed that those Catholics had no idea what they were doing by the gestures they did. What does genuflecting even mean? That was my mindset. What are it, what's this, what, did the, what do these things even mean? Do they even know what they mean? Not only did he know what it meant, but it had more power and truth to it than any gesture I did. May our Lord's life, death, resurrection, and ascension be on your lips and quick to share with another and Every time you make that gesture at Mass, say that prayer. Really mean it. May it be right here. And may I be quick. Give me whatever grace I need to just 
do that. To share it. I'm going to talk just a couple minutes about my conversion. Is that okay with you? Okay. So dad was a Protestant minister. He was Wesleyan when I was little, which is evangelical, and um, very much into personal sanctification and holiness. But we didn't have sacraments. We had baptism, but it was when you're older, at the age of accountability, not for for babies. In about second grade, third grade, I went to this children's um, club. It was a Christian children's club. And I was introduced to what we called the prayer of the sinner's prayer of salvation, okay? Was, and you've probably heard it from evangelicals. Jesus, come into my heart, be Lord of my life, forgive me my, sin, my sins. But it's not in a sacramental way, so we didn't go to confession. Um, and at that moment, in that moment, I really meant it. I'm a sinner. I want Jesus, and I want him to be the Lord of my life. From that moment on, I was, that's what I wanted. And I gave my life to Christ, which is what we called it. And I went to my parents, and I said, I want to be baptized. Now, you would think, they'd be like, yay, let's do this thing. They said, you're not old enough. I said, I want to receive communion. Now, for us, it was just a symbol. We didn't have a sacramental, and we didn't have the apostolic succession to be able to have the Eucharist, but we we had communion as Protestants, and it was symbolic, but I, I knew that it was special, and I knew Christ was mine, and I wanted to receive communion, and I was told, you don't understand it. You're not old enough, and I said all this stuff about symbolically it means this and this and this, which is what they believed. And my mom was like, yeah, that's what we believe, but you're still not old enough. I, have a, I had a grandfather who was a farmer who died shortly after that in a tragic farming accident. My dad left pastoral ministry for a while, and we moved to the family farm to help my grandmother. And there were two Presbyterian churches without a pastor at that time. My dad started filling in, giving the sermons on Sundays for them, while they looked for a new pastor, which is how it's done. It's not just automatic, like you have a new priest. When one leaves, you have a new priest. It's not like that in the Presbyterian church. And they asked my dad to come and be their minister. So he went to seminary. He hadn't been to seminary, just Bible college. And do you know what Presbyterians believe? They believe in infant baptism. So my parents had us baptized. And that's kind of, that's like miscommunity. I mean, that's, like you're getting mixed signals, right? So you, you, you were in one Protestant church that doesn't believe in it, and then you're like in another Protestant church, and now they do believe it, and you told me no when I wanted it, and now that I haven't thought about it for a while, you're telling me, oh, by the way, next week you're going to be baptized. So that kind of is confusing. And he had reasons, and I won't get to that, um, but that's how we became Presbyterian. Presbyterians have some sacraments. They pray the Apostles' Creed. So there are some things that are closer to the early church. They also pray the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer is what they call it. We know it as the Our Father. So I was like, and I had cousins who were Assembly of God and other cousins who were Nazarenes. I mean, my great-great-grandmother was a Quaker minister. So it's like, I learned early on, you, Denise, can be anything you want to be as a Christian, but you cannot be Catholic. And yet, here's the thing, when I became Catholic that I realized, everything that was good in all of those denominations that I knew, every part that was beautiful and true, You didn't have to go to one at the expense of the other things that were good and true. If you wanted all of it, it was Catholic. Do you believe in personal sanctification? Yes, I do. You don't have to just be Wesleyan. You can be Catholic. Do you believe in a sacramental life? Yes, I do. You don't have to just be Presbyterian or Lutheran or Episcopalian. You 
can be Catholic. Do you believe in the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit? I do. Then you don't have to just be Assembly of God or Pentecostal. You can be Catholic. Why do we call it? We're not arrogant when we say this is the fullness of the faith. It's full because it's full. Like a glass is full to the top. It's not arrogant. It's true. So my dad died in 2003, and I kind of told you that part of the story. And I was reading my way essentially into the book, or into the church through books. And I went into the local Catholic church, Immaculate Heart of Mary, and I said, I think I'm supposed to be Catholic, but I don't know what to do. Well, we can help you with that. Um, I'm like, well, good. And I thought they'd be like, yeah, you're a Protestant minister's daughter, and you were married to a Protestant minister. We never get converts like you. Come on in. We're going to be so excited, and those were so proud. No, that's not what they said at all. They said, um, you're married again. Yeah, okay, well, that could be an impediment, so we've got to figure this first marriage thing out, what happened, if it was a sacrament or not. And I was like, oh. And what I told the priest is what the priest told me, and what I told the priest is, well, like, I have read John 6 and worked through that already, so I know that's Jesus in the Eucharist, and I love Jesus, so I want to come in. And, but there's something you need to know up front. I can never worship Mary. I cannot do it. And Father Stoltz looked at me, and he said, um, well, that's good, because we will not, we don't want you to. We'll tell you that's wrong. That's not a teaching of the church. What? No, that's not a teaching of the church. She's not divine. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead. God is divine. Mary, we venerate. She's the mother of our Lord. That's amazing. She gave her yes to God. That's amazing. But we don't worship her. But you pray to her. Yes. And there are different meanings to what pray is. Pray is worship. Pray is petition. Right? Pray is praise. Thanksgiving. When we talk about praying to Mary, we're like, Mary, you're right there at the altar in heaven. Can you intercede for me? So when other denominations, when I'm not other denominations, when denominations, Protestants say to you, you pray to Mary. So, like, that means you worship Mary. So, like, no, yes, worship is a way to pray. But that kind of prayer is never given to Mary. We do not worship her. When we pray to Mary, we pray for her to help us, to intercede for us. And if you ever ask me to pray for you, that's what we're doing. But guess what? I'm not at the altar in heaven, and I'm not perfect. And I'm certainly not the mother of our Lord. All of those are really good reasons to have her pray for you. I'll pray for you too, but those are all really good reasons for you to ask her to pray for you too. So I joined RCIA and I came into the church. And I don't have enough time in this talk to do this, so I might start with this in the next one. But I had a trouble. I had huge trouble with Mary as the Immaculate Conception. And I'll start with that before I get to the next one. But I want you to know that conversion requires a change of heart. And we are talking about your conversion right now. In a minute, we're going to talk about evangelizing others and helping them to convert. But if there are pieces of you that have fallen away, you need your heart to have ongoing conversion. And it's not necessarily easy, but it's totally worth it. And if you think it's not possible, it's completely possible in Christ with the graces. So whatever you struggle with, it will cause your efficacy to be an evangelist and share the gospel to be constrained. So you need to be about the business not only because you want be sanctified, but in order to be the best evangelizer and share of the good news of the gospel to others, in order to do that the very best that you can, you have to be 
fully committed to this journey, okay? You have to be ready to have all of those little corners of your heart cleaned out where the dust likes to settle. So maybe you're here today, and that is something you need to do. It is the first step. It is what you need to do. And you need to be open to whatever God wants to do with you. God, what do you need me to clean up so that I can be who you need me to be? Think of Mary. Now, she didn't have anything that she needed to clean up, but she was so totally open. She was in that state where there was nothing There was no impediment to her being everything God wanted her to be. She was everything God wanted her to be. And God took on human form within her. So if we try to be everything God wants us to be in the state we are in, and we are not the Immaculate Conception, but if we give ourselves over ongoing conversion, imagine what you can do. Look to Mary as your model. Activate those gifts by being completely open to what God wants of you. I'm going to close with this, with this first talk, and I want to turn now to St. Monica. What did that mean for her? St. Monica gave everything that she was, all that she was, to God for the conversion of those in her family. Specifically, St. Augustine, what does it do? It takes someone who is absolutely as far away from God as they possibly can be, who's living a, a life of absolute scandal, because she was open and fully committed to ongoing conversion for herself. She was able to give birth to Augustine twice. Once physically giving birth to him, the second time being absolutely instrumental to his rebirth. Be St. Monica. Be so open to being all that God wants you to be that you not only have the, the great grace of being able to be mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, but that you can be instrumental in another person's rebirth. This is why we start by talking about conversion. On a novena to bring others to Christ and the sacraments. In order for you to do that to the best ability that you can and be as effective as you can possibly be, you need to be a person who says yes to your conversions your ongoing conversion. So, as we close this first talk, I want you to go into your your heart of hearts. And I want you to lay the people before God that you want to lay before him. And I want you to ask God, no, let me rephrase that. I want you to submit to God. I want you to say, St. Monica, help me to do this. Help me to look for those things that need to just be purged, cleaned up, so that I can be as efficacious for the people I'm praying for. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. God the Father, I ask you to, through power of the Holy Spirit, give us more of Christ. Show us with the eyes of Christ to find those places that need to be converted within us. For our own sake, that we will run the race, but not in vain. But secondly, so that we can be the most effective witnesses for Christ that we can possibly be. We ask this through Jesus Christ, St. Monica, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.